day when there was a riot, one of the priests tripped up and spilled the holy water and there was a stampede and fighting broke out. And it's estimated that nearly 2,000 people were either seriously injured or killed. Now Jesus goes up into the midst of the feast with the eyes of everybody. Those frowning Pharisees and those dumb, what were the other, Sadducees. Oh, the Pharisees liked him because he raised the dead. And the Sadducees said, there isn't such a thing as a resurrection. That's why, was, that's why, we, that's why they were Sadducees. <coughs> Thank you. I thought the penny might drop after a while. <coughs> oh, they loved to hear him because he believed in, and not only believed it, but he actually raised the dead. The trouble with our theology is all on the blackboard. Our theology is all in textbooks. It has no life, it has no breath, it has no power, it has no authority. How in the world did Jesus stand in the middle of that crowd of vexed, angry people? He'd antagonize them. He'd reveal their spiritual bankruptcy. <clears throat> they were just getting over the shock of John Baptist standing there in the wilderness. They couldn't fathom it. Why are people going? Read the third chapter of Luke when you go home. Even the Roman soldiers went. Macefield would call them the lesser breeds outside of the law. They were fascinated when they heard him. Nothing like this in Rome. Caesar has nothing like this. Here is a little strange man with a leather girdle around his loins and old camel skin around his neck. And people are swarming from everywhere. What does he say? Read the four laws. He uses that word nobody likes, repent. Repent. Not only confess your sin, forsake your sin. Repent, run away from it. Then Jesus comes up afterwards. I don't know what all the order is in this, but you know, I, I was reading today the last verses of the 20th chapter and the 21st. Somebody has estimated <clears throat> that if you could take all the events that are mentioned in the Gospel recorded by John and put them in a line, they would only give you 21 days out of the three and a half years that Jesus ministered. I'll go further than that. I say if you took Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and take all these historic events, <clears throat> like this miracle that upset the whole town. Don't you think when the next day, after he turned water into wine, that everywhere they were saying, did you hear what he did? They ran out of wine last night, and he turned water into wine. This is the man that tosses people out of the synagogue. This is the man that kicks over the extortioners. This is the man that says to learned men, you're the enemies of God. He's merciless. You know, we're, we are preaching an acceptable gospel today. Make it as painless as we can. And all we do is give people a shot to put them to sleep so they'll get to hell quicker. We need some hellfire preaching on repentance. Amen. Amen. One old definition says repentance is to leave <coughs> the sin I've done before and show that I in earnest grieve by doing it no more. Amen. If a man is genuinely born again, all things pass away, all old things pass away, and all things become new. <clears throat> so here we have Jesus right in the center of the uh, crowd. You see, for six days what happened, they had a wonderful performance. What are they thinking of? Jesus stood there where the priest had stood every day for seven days and then the temple orchestra came with their instruments and the temple choir came and they went down the shoulder of the hill to the pool of Siloam and they dipped that golden vessel into the pool and the priest carried it on his shoulder with pomp and circumstance and he went and poured it out. To what? To remind them of what? That when they cried there in the, in the wilderness they had no water and God told Moses to smite the rock and he smote it. Told him to speak to it the second time and he still smote it. He got into habits. But they were commemorating that tremendous event when that river followed them, that river of life followed them wherever they went 
and the rock that was smitten that was Christ, the word of God says. So for seven days they'd seen this performance. Everybody stood on one side and bowed when they came back. Oh, you think what God did. God that put the stars up there. God that one day parted like you part your hair. He parted the rivers, the water. And over a million people passed through. This is our God. They're commemorating the miracle. On the last day, the great day of the feast, they did not go through that performance. And Jesus went and stood there. I, uh, if I were an artist, I'd want to paint this. I think around the world art galleries I've been, I've seen all kinds of pictures about the Lord. I've never seen a picture of Jesus, Jesus standing here in all his moral majesty. Why in God's name don't they go punch him? Why doesn't somebody do what? They've already put an assassin's threat on him. We'll kill him. The people say, well, why don't you kill him? He's standing there. He's no bodyguards. There's no angels around him. Well, actually, I think he had a bodyguard of angels. I think he stood there in his moral majesty and they could feel what we call vibes going out of him of the glory of God that they didn't go near him. I say, and I say, I think this is one of the most gorgeous pictures of Jesus in the whole of the New Testament. But the last day, the great day of the feast, it says Jesus stood and cried. <clears throat> Isaiah says, my servant shall not cry in the streets. Well, he's not crying in the street. He's not crying in the street at all. He's crying in the temple. He's crying to a particular crowd of people. But he adds insult to injury. I remind you again, he'd already called them a den of thieves, he'd already tossed the money changers out, he'd stunned them with the miracles that he'd done, <clears throat> and yet, this is what he says to them. These people have a monopoly of God. Didn't they have uh, ancestry like Jeremiah and Isaiah and these huge, enormous characters? But this man comes, this unlettered man, this usurper, this man with no backing stands in the middle of the Holy of Holies as far as they're concerned. It's like me rushing into the Vatican and shouting hallelujah and starting to praise the Lord. Wouldn't gone down too well, I'd like the chance though. <coughs> <laughs> and there he is in the middle of the feast. And listen to what he says. If any man... Hey, hold it a minute. You can't say that. Jehovah is the God of the Jews. The Ten Commandments are given to the Jews. All those giants you talk about spiritually who subdued kingdoms and wrought righteousness and stopped the mouths of land, they're all Jews. Why do you dare to say to this cosmopolitan crowd here, if any man can? I think one of the most beautiful things that even Paul said, my great favorite preacher, the Apostle Paul. Remember what he says in two, uh, what is it, in the second of Corinthians chapter 5, is it 5.17? Don't look now. Look after and find out I'm wrong. But anyhow. <clears throat> Do you remember what he said? If any man. Did he say that? What did he say? Fun? Right. I'm glad you're not all sleeping. That's great. <laughs> if any man, anywhere, at any time, being Christ... He may be the most twisted, perverted, carnal, cruel, stinking man in the whole world. But if the miracle of regeneration comes in him, he gets a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit, a new inlook, a new outlook, new everything. We've forgotten about the majesty of the new birth. People just nod their head and say the sinner's prayer and go straight to hell down the aisle they, after they've leaned their head on the shoulder of the pastor. You know, I doubt if 5% of professing Christians in America are born again. It's true of England. I asked that giant of the man, Buck Singh, the man from India. Do you ever meet him out there, brother? You've got to see him this time. He's getting old. He's about 86. He is a man. 
is a man that's going over the world and he goes to the railway station without a penny and orders his ticket. I believe in faith, but not fanaticism. I mean, <coughs> you know. I mean, you, what if you embarrass God? But it, you don't embarrass God. But I asked him one day, of all the professing Christians in India, how many have saved? He said about two and a half percent. Well, what about the Christians in America, Brother Singh? He said, uh, two and a half percent. I'm astounded, bewildered, confused, baffled when people tell me in America we've 75 million people filled with the Holy Ghost and with the rottenest nation on earth. Come on! <clears throat> It says here that Jesus stood and cried. One version says with a loud voice. <clears throat> it was not a shriek. It was not a scream. The Greek word implies that he did it with authority. He did it loudly. He did it emphatically. He did it with emotion. Why? Well, I'll tell you what I discovered last week in this, and I've preached on this 40 or 50 years, never found it. <clears throat> Here he is in the temple, two or three, four, five thousand people around him. And he stands there and he cries with a loud voice. Why? <clears throat> because time is running out for these people, and they're dumb and blind, they don't know it. They'd had the law, they'd had the prophets, they'd had one of the most amazing men in history previous to Jesus coming, and what did they do? They got rid of him too. Chopped his head off. Jesus stood and cried with a loud voice in my judgment for this reason. <clears throat> that he knew that time was running out. That God's Spirit does not always strive with men. There's a cut-off point. <clears throat> I'm trying to think of a, a verse here, I can't remember right at the moment. I believe that Jesus is running in his mind, going through history. God gave them a margin of deliverance for the time that John Baptist was here. They still did the same thing. They'd had the law, they'd had the prophets, they'd had the most amazing men in history. They'd repeatedly got into captivity. This might, may not be a good definition, but my definition of a fool is a man that falls in the same hole twice. That's exactly what Israel did. They'd been in captivity for 400 years under Pharaoh. Wouldn't you think that they'd shun everything that would in any way defile them in the sight of God? And yet they're just coming here out of 400 years of captivity again. <clears throat> Let me look at a verse here. Matthew, what is it? No, that's only another reference. Matthew, anyhow, you can put it down if you want, to Matthew 